we're going to worship through prayer uh, before we do that. Let me tell you a couple things that we want to have on our mind. One is we want to pray for Miss Anita Wansley. Uh, she is the principal at Northeast Elementary. So if we're going to pray for our third grade teachers, at some point we got to you know get around and pray for the quarterback too, right? Anita is an incredible Christian woman uh, that has done a great job of putting together a loving staff there. And we want to pray for her, especially this week. She gets the week off, right? That she would be blessed with that and rejuvenated to come back to the responsibility that she has. Uh, we also want to pray for this deacon election. It's kind of a big deal, right? That's We're electing those who will serve the congregation. Remember, our the way we do things is our council handles business and decisions. The deacons aren't even allowed to do any of that, right? The deacons, are on, their responsibility is to help care for the congregation and lead in missions. So that's what you want to have in your mind uh, as you make the choices that you make. Uh, and we want to pray uh, over that. We'll also say a prayer that the Lord will Get our minds ready for Thanksgiving because I, I know if, if you're like me, it just sneaks up on you. And all of a sudden Thursday you're eating and you forget what we're trying to think about. Uh, so we'll ask the Lord to kind of get our minds right with that this week. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be in your house. It's good to be with your people. And we ask that you would provide health and healing for our, our families that aren't here, uh, that are sick. Um, that you would be with them and they would know that we are thinking about them and missing them. And our love would be transmitted to them. We ask that you would put your hand of blessing on Miss Wansley, the incredible work that we've entrusted to her, and the incredible job she does with it. We express thanksgiving to you for that and ask that you would bless her. Bless her with a, a time of rest and relaxation this week, that she would be rejuvenated with time with her family and around a table, and the same for all the teachers that we've adopted. That you would bless them with the energy and bless her with the energy she needs to come back and to lead well through the end of the year. I ask that you would give us wisdom and guidance and insight as each of us use our right and responsibility to make a decision to elect deacons for next year. That you would help us to be thoughtful in the way we do it. That you would guide and bless the decisions that are made. We trust that you work through that process and then follow you and, and follow your guidance in it. We know that this week is going to be hectic and chaotic and it's easy to slip into the holiday of Thursday and kind of forget what it is we're supposed to be doing and what at least should be in the back of our mind. And I ask that you would give each of us a moment of pause, maybe today during the service or this afternoon, but at some point would you speak to our hearts and reveal to us the things to be thankful for, the blessings that you have provided for us that maybe we don't see every day that aren't obvious and that you would reveal in a way that it's so clear to us that that is you being gracious and loving to us. And that we would respond in worship and in thanksgiving. We ask your blessings on this week, on this holiday, with our Advent season that starts next Sunday. And that you will be glorified in everything that we do. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our last chance to... Uh, Think about the kingdom of God at least for a couple of weeks, and uh, it's our last chance to be for me to trick you into saying a prayer, right? And then finding out what it is that you just prayed about. So we're going to do what we've done for the last several weeks. I want to ask that you would uh, pray with me the Lord's prayer, emphasizing the what I consider the pinnacle of that: Thy kingdom come, and Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we're going to look at a passage in Matthew that shows us what that kingdom looks like and what it is we've just asked the Lord to do. So let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so this is our last time of a, a five or six weeks thinking about the, the kingdom of God and obviously what our main thought has been the ethic of the kingdom of God. How do we live as citizens? And let's just stop and make sure we kind of piece all the puzzles together. I mean, the, all the pieces of the puzzle together before we grab the last piece and think about what is it that we know, all right? First off, we know that the kingdom of God is never anything that like we expect, right? And I hope you've, man, I hope you've caught on to that, that every time we stand up here on Sunday, it's like, yeah, that's not what I thought that was going to be. That's not what the rest of the world thought it was going to be, that every time we stop and think about the kingdom of God, Jesus is like, hey, surprise, I do things differently from what you were thinking. One of the things that's really important, especially as we look at the passage from Matthew 25 for today, is to remember that with the kingdom of God, 
judgment comes, right? That Christ has come and established His kingdom and one day He will come and return and in that return there's going to be an act of judgment. We don't like that. We don't talk about it much but we cannot ignore the fact that judgment is coming which means that each one of us, everyone, will answer to the way in which we have taken advantage of opportunities or squandered opportunities or treated people. The stewardship we talked about last week, you will answer to that someday. And then the final kind of overarching theme is that the kingdom of God is something that exists already. And yet it's not yet complete, right? It's not yet finished because Christ establishes it. It is here and you and I are citizens of it. It lives in you and in me. But it's not complete. And God's ultimate authority and reign over the things of this world has not been fully realized. Which means that still some things happen here the way He doesn't want them to happen. Some things happen here that aren't according to the way we understand right and wrong because that battle is still being played out, although the victory has already been established. So we know that about the kingdom of God. And then under those assumptions of what we know about the kingdom and under the primarily that assumption that the kingdom of God is something that it's already here, meaning that it lives within us, it's present in the church, and you and I as citizens of the kingdom of God therefore have to live as citizens of that kingdom in a world that may or may not care or recognize or look anything like the way we think the world should be, we've explored the ethics of what that looks like. How do we live as citizens, as sort of like aliens in a world that are part of a different kingdom? It's one of the things that we've caught on to, and I'm just, I'm building, right? Let's just stay with me. I'm building, let you see the big picture, is that we're influencers. We started there in Matthew 5. We are salt and light, right? You and I are designed. We are here for the purpose of influencing the world around us. And the whole thought behind everything that we've talked about in the last month and a half is that we are working to bring about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that, and then we work to bring it about in the way that we live. And we know that that's not something you and I will probably ever see completely done, but in small things. We think about the life and the ministry of Jesus. He brought about the kingdom in very small places. He saves this person's life, and He changes this person's life. He doesn't do it in massive, sweeping organizational change. It's one instance and one person at a time. And you and I continue that ministry. We continue that work of bringing about the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven in small ways. Part of that means that we are stewards of the talents, if you remember from last week, to be responsible for the things that God has given to us and to use them for kingdom ministry. And other, like, uh, overall, the, the, the ethic that we have brought on to and then that builds us into this week is that as citizens of the kingdom, our ethic is to, in all instances, put other people first. All right. So everything that we do and every thought that we make and every decision that we make, every time we come to a moral decision, the kingdom answer to that is going to be the sacrifice of self for the benefit of someone else. Right? That we put other people first because that's what Christ has done for you and for me. And that brings us to our final parable in Matthew 25. We're looking at the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now I'll tell you, like obviously I've had to hand you know pick and choose a couple, but ev almost every single parable, Jesus. Jesus says, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, starts with the kingdom of heaven is like or the kingdom of God is like. Parables are the primary tool through which Jesus reveals the kingdom to us. So you can go back and study this you know, to your heart's extent. But we're going to look at the sheep and the goats uh, as our final installment in this, this series. I want you to read it with me. So Matthew 25, start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, he will sit on his glorious throne. What's he talking about, right? This is the judgment that is coming, the return of Christ, the consummation of the kingdom, the not yet being fully realized. So just that's what we're seeing. He says in verse 32, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger, invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison, or go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he'll say to those on his left, 
Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared by the, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You didn't look after me. And they also answered, Lord, what? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger and needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? And he'll reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment with the righteous to eternal life. This is not a fun story. Right? It's a terrifying story. Matter of fact, I, I really thought about let's just not do this one because it's scary. And this is the week of Thanksgiving, right? We're supposed to be getting into the season of joy. But no, one last installment of oh my gosh. And then we'll get into the season of joy. So that's whole thing. And kingdom principles that are present here, before we even get to the ethic, is, is what? That Christ will return. All right? So everything that comes next is predicated on that, that truth that you and I established and we have to accept. Christ is coming back. We don't know when. We don't know where. But we know that it will happen. And when He does, what's going to occur? A judgment of some kind. A separation of some kind. Now, don't kid yourself to think that you fully understand what that judgment's going to look like. I don't fully understand what that judgment's going to look like, but I know that it's going to happen. And it seems that, that the way in which we live, the way in which we behave, the things that we do on earth somehow play into whether you end up on the left or whether you end up on the right. That we will be judged based on our response to and obedience to the kingdom of God. Now, I, I don't want this to interfere with, and, and this is kind of one of those asides, you can come and ask me about it on the back. Don't let this overpower our universal understanding from Scripture of how we are held, held in the hand of God. And that your salvation is not you know, won or lost based on what you, you do, right? My salvation is established not by me acting righteously, but because Christ has saved me and His righteousness covers me. So somehow like, this interacts with that, but doesn't, I, doesn't supersede it. So I know that one day Christ is going to come and I'm going to come before Him and judgment's going to happen for me. And I think what's going to happen, in my understanding at least, is He's going to walk me through, Hey David, you had this opportunity. What'd you do with that? And I'm like, well, I kind of blew that one. And he goes, all right, you had this chance. What'd you do with that? Well, I was kind of ugly with that person. And he's going to walk through all the chances where I, I did wrong, where I didn't take an opportunity, or where I treated someone inhumane, whatever it was. And, and I'm going to have to say, you're right. I'm, I blew that. I didn't do it right. And I'm going to have to answer for that. I'm going to have to stand before the Almighty and the All-Holy all One and recognize how unholy I am. And I think the shame and embarrassment and heartache of that moment will remind me of where I belong. And then He declares me righteous by the blood of Christ. And in that moment will set me up for an eternity of worship that I don't know that I can even fully accept and comprehend in this moment. Because in that moment I'll be so fully aware of how depraved I really have been and how glorious the grace of Christ is for me. But that doesn't change the fact that that judgment is coming. And at some point, when Christ returns, every one of us will answer for, will be held accountable for the things that we have done, the opportunities that we have taken or squandered here on earth, and we will answer that. We will be judged by what we do here, which tells us that the way that we live, what we do on earth, it matters. It has significance and importance in the overall life of the kingdom of God. Now we think about here in this little parable, which is the lesson for us, the sheep and the goats are judged by how they cared for what he called what the least of these, right? Which is what gives us then to our ethic. And I hope this is pretty clear, but I'm going to use the words anyway in case it's not. The kingdom ethic from this is what? Provide for the least of these, right? The providing for basic human care and needs for people around us. That is a kingdom ethic. That we look at humans around us and we see them as valuable. We see them as worthy of our sacrifice of some kind for us to make sure that they are provided for and they are cared for. Now you go through and look at all the things that the, that the sheep provided and the goats didn't provide. It basically boils down to they, they provided the three basic things of human life. Food, shelter, companionship. Did you notice the way that plays out? Like they were hungry and thirsty, food. I, I was you know, either in prison or I didn't have a place to stay. They provided shelter. They, they comforted me or visited me, companionship. Those are the three things that you and I cannot live without. If you don't eat or drink, what happens? You die. 
If you don't get protection from the elements around you, what happens? You die. If you don't have any form of human interaction or companionship, what happens? You die. You don't think about that one a lot, but you have to have it. Those are three things that humans have to have to serve. That's what it means to be alive. And those are the things that, that Jesus in this parable dis- used to discern about whether or not we have shown love and care for people around us. So if we want to take like the real simpleness to it, and then you can take a nap if you want to, is this. Is that our, our calling, our ethic is to provide those around us who have needs, these three basic needs of human life. Food, shelter, and companionship. Now, I'm just going to make an assumption because most of you have been in church at least one other time, right? Yeah, all of you have been in church at least one other time because I've seen you here before. Okay, you know this already. This is not new for you. That we, as citizens of the kingdom of God, are to care for and to provide for the basic needs of other people, those basic human. And we do that, right? We've got a thing of food back here that's ready to go. I've got a stuff that's in my office right now that's going to the school. We are doing that, and truth is we're doing it pretty well and should feel good about it. But then there's a question here, and this is where things get ugly for us, and we have to work with it, is who do we do that for? We know I'm supposed to provide for those around me. I'm supposed to meet the needs of those who are needy. But who is needy? How do I define what he uses here in the phrase, the the least of these? Who are the least of these? Well, that breaks down really into two questions. The first question is this. Is, Is Jesus telling us that we're supposed to do this for like Christian brothers and sisters, like just within the family? Or is it supposed to be more universally applied? Are we responsible to do that to everyone that's around us? Well, and, and truth is, this is a big conversation. Theologians have argued about this for years and trying to understand what words are used here and how it plays out in, in, in other texts. But there's a lot of evidence here. That, there's a lot of evidence for sure. And I'll just, let's just say this because it's fun. Is that we're responsible to care for one another in the family, right? There's a lot of evidence even to say that we're supposed to care for the, the, the ministers and the the missionaries and the pastors and the things who provide leadership and, and take risks on behalf of the kingdom and the church. And we have responsibility to care for them and to provide for them. But think about what the overall teaching of Scripture is. What do you hear over and over and over again, Old Testament and New Testament, when it comes to caring for other people? It's pretty universal. <clears throat> It outright is universal that the overall teaching of Scripture is to care for the poor, for the least of these. It's just a general phrase. Like, for instance, there's a proverb. It's Proverbs chapter 21. All right. It says this. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. So Proverbs does best. It puts us back in our lab. Like, if I cry out, I want somebody to hear me. Right. Like, I want you to notice that I'm in pain. Well, the same thing is. If you shut your ears to those who are in need, that means no one's going to hear you when you in need. It's, it's an impetus. It's a push to care for the poor in general. And then we think about Christ's ministry. Think about the way that Jesus lived his life. Jesus cared for the poor during his ministry. He didn't care who they were. He didn't care if they were Roman, Jewish, whatever, Gentile. He, he saw someone in need. And he had compassion on them. Matter of fact, if you go back and read through the the Gospels, you're going to see that phrase over and over and over again where Jesus sees someone who's struggling, sick, poor, dead, whatever it is. And it's going to say that he sees the person and he has compassion. There's not any other qualifier there. It's just compassion on a human who is hurting And we think about most of his miracles were compassion miracles towards those who had some kind of need. And there wasn't any qualifier there. It wasn't just for the 12 that were following him around, what we would understand as the church in that day. So the answer to question number one is, who are the least of these? Well, it's not just within the family. I think that's an automatic. But the the requirement for kingdom ethic of care and providing for needs is more of a universal thing that we look for the least of these everywhere and provide care and, and, and love for them. But then that brings us to another question that gets really, really touchy. Does everybody deserve it? Does everyone deserve my compassion? Does everyone deserve my sacrifice in order to help them meet their needs? And this boils down to a, a long standing conversation between what we call the worthy 
and the unworthy poor. All right? And historically, especially Western civilization, has historically made a distinction between the worthy and the unworthy poor. Matter of fact, this goes back to 1348. All right, check this. This is a law from England in 1348 called the Statute of Laborers, where it officially separated the poor into two categories. You had the worthy poor, and then you had the unworthy poor. And the American colonies adopted the same idea and, and, and separated poor into two things. So our entire world, the worldview that you and I are raised in, going back to the 1300s, has always separated. You've got the worthy poor and the unworthy poor. The worthy poor would be like the widows, those who were ill, those who were sick, those who are elders, those who are disabled and unable to work. And we look at them and say, something has happened to you, and therefore you're not able to do what you should be able to do to provide for yourself. So what will we do? We'll make sure you're okay. And it kind of had even this hierarchy. Families would do it, and that's the idea. It's like, all right, so if I get disabled, who's supposed to take care of me? My wife and my dad. But what if I don't have a wife and a dad or kids, right? Then the, the, the town would assume responsibility. And that's the way it was. If families weren't able or weren't there to take care of the worthy poor, then the town would do it. And they would create like a, an almshouse or an area for the poor. We, that eventually became what we know as orphanages. That You can see how that develops in our society to look at those who we considered worthy, who had had something happen to them. And as a society, we said, okay, that's not fair. They're the worthy poor, so we're going to take care of them and make sure they are okay. The flip side is what we decided were the unworthy poor what we would call able-bodied unemployed people, right? Criminals, strangers, the guys that are sitting on their front porch all day smoking something that you're not supposed to have instead of going to work, you know what I'm saying? Those kind of guys. And we look at them, it's like, you could be doing something. You could be adding something to society. You could at least be taking care of yourself, so I shouldn't have to take care of you. So we considered them as even useless and unworthy. So we saw them, you could be handling for yourself, so therefore we're not going to assume responsibility for it. So what, as a society, that we do is we would arrest them, we would make them the slaves, we would put them to work, or in the very worst, would send them out of town. You've heard old histories about that. Just We ran somebody out of town, out into the wilderness, never to be seen again, and just didn't care about it anymore, because they were unworthy, and now they're out of sight, and now they're out of mind. Doesn't that just seem right? It does. It does. Like, it seems right. Like, I think about, all right, I work, what am I, like 60, 65 hours a week at this point. That gives me X number of dollars and X number of free time. And if I've only got X number of dollars and X number of free time, how am I going to, I'm not going to spend that on everybody, right? I'm only going to spend that money to help someone who is worthy. Because some people deserve our help because they can't help themselves. And some people are just lazy. And I'm thinking, no, you're lazy. I don't want to help you because I've been busting it all week. Why are you not just busting it all week? And it just eats us up. I know it eats you. It eats me up when I see people take advantage of a system or lazy or entitled. Y'all know where I work. I work in West Jackson. I see this every day where they're just lazy. And I'm like, what are you doing? I don't want to help you. I don't have anything to do with you. I don't feel any impetus to be like, oh, let me make sure your three basic human needs are met because I don't want to waste my hard-earned money helping you or you could be doing it yourself. There seems to be in our society since at least the 1300s has written it down to make a distinction between what we call worthy poor and unworthy poor. Society makes that distinction. Now here's the problem. Scripture doesn't. Society makes that distinction. I even make that distinction. But Scripture doesn't. And you and I, as followers of Jesus and citizens of the kingdom of God, find this to be our ultimate authority. And this book is what defines for us how we live. And our ethic comes from that, not from what we think, not even what we consider common sense, but from what Scripture tells us. And the Scripture doesn't make that type of distinction. We look at this little story. Sheep are rewarded for caring for the least of these. There is no other exception even mentioned in this little story. So when we care for others, when we care for those, whether we consider them worthy or unworthy, it doesn't matter. It's as if we cared for Christ himself. And that's the way Jesus Jesus lays it out in the story, and that's it. The ethic just stops there. And this is one of those places where, man, we just kind of get, oh, kicked in the face and have to deal with it. Because you and I, for the last 700 and something years, have said, this is the way it is. I only have X number of resources, so I'm only going to give them to the worthy. And those who are unworthy, well, you make your own bed. So be it. But then we read the Bible. 
and Scripture speaks against our common sense. Scripture speaks against what we assume is right and wrong and instead reveals to us what is actually right and wrong. And that's one of those places where the kingdom gets weird sometimes. Because often the ethic coming from the kingdom of God who follow a, a Lord who sacrifices himself for the benefit of the people who tried to kill him doesn't make sense. Ethic, life within the kingdom of God is almost never common sense. It's always different. Often even opposite from that. Because Christ was different and lived differently. And what we do is in creating, and this is where the theology plays into this, in creating the division between, say, worthy and unworthy, what we've done is we have then put ourselves in the seat of judge. And we have judged for ourselves that some humans are valuable and therefore worthy of our effort to help, and that some humans are expendable and don't have value. And we look at them, we have to, it, that goes against everything we understand of the sanctity of life. That's the theology that is there, is we put ourselves in the place of judge and assume the right to determine the value of another human life. And I don't get to do that. I don't get to do that because no human is expendable. We think about what we hear from Jesus, you know, that Jesus sacrificed himself for whosoever is the, the phrase we get from John 3.16. So that what? So that everybody, there's this, there's this openness to the way in which Christ lived and the way that he did his ministry and the, the way in which he has come to bring salvation to everyone who will receive it. That human equality is a truly Christian ideal because you and I know better than anyone else that we are all equal before God. We all come before God. We are all judged because of our sins and we are all desperately in need of Jesus. There is no hierarchy there. We're all the same. Now, I know we're not all Catholic, right? But I want you to hear something that the, that the Pope once said. John Paul II, just a brilliant man, good theologian. He, he was critiquing our culture and was talking about uh, like how we're supposed to care and love for, for the least of these. This was a passage he wrote on this, this text. He said this. He said, a person who, because of illness, handicap, or more simply just by existing, compromises the well-being or lifestyle of those more favored, tends to be looked upon as an enemy to be resisted or eliminated. In this way, a kind of conspiracy against life is unleashed. That someone who compromises my well-being, instead of seeing them as a human in need, we see them as an enemy or so are a, a barrier to my self-growth. Instead of as a person who needs help, we see them as a threat to be eliminated. That's not very Christ-like. I think he was on to something. And you and I have to stop back, and this is where ethics get weird for us, because maybe, maybe, maybe governments... Maybe social services have to make some form of distinction, right? Because governments are not Christ-like, and they have to make a distinction between worthy and unworthy and have standards and set things in place and whatever. That's a government decision that you and I belong to another kingdom. Our ethic is clear. Citizens of the kingdom of God don't make a distinction between worthy and unworthy. Our theology, our affirmation of human dignity, and our interconnectedness as all beings who are made in God's image doesn't allow us to make such distinctions. And it requires us to provide love and care for all of what Jesus would have called here the least of these. We do that too much. We make distinctions too much. We put ourselves in the place of judge too much. And our path to redemption, our true Christian ethic, is what I would call the practice of Christian hospitality. That's the ethic that comes out of this. To provide for human needs to others is an act of Christian hospitality. Marjorie Thompson said this in a book. I've got this awesome book in my office. If you want to see it, I'll, I'll loan it to you. It's called Soul Feast. All right. Just the title itself is cool. A Soul Feast. All right. Anyway, you didn't care. But she defines hospitality as this. As receiving Leaving the other from the heart into my own dwelling place. It's not about like putting out the right tablescape, right, and providing the right food. It's the receiving of the other from the heart into my own dwelling place. That I will make a space 
for someone else. Now that space can be at my table and that's where that plays out in a very tangible way, but a space in my heart to hear you, to care about your story, to acknowledge that you have any matter or value at all and to make yourself important to me. That is me showing hospitality to you. She goes on that it entails providing for the need, comfort and delight of the other with all the openness, respect, freedom, tenderness and joy that love itself embodies. And that is our kingdom ethic to love and care and to provide for others, period. No matter what, our ethic doesn't allow us to leave others out. And you and I know that that flies in the face of the culture we live in. It does. It is extremely countercultural. Think, think about what television teaches us. Y'all remember the, uh, thankfully it's kind of dying also, but the whole concept of reality TV, right? What is, the, what is the basic nugget of, say, reality TV? Is to get someone on stage and then make fun of them for something, right? That's really what it is. To make fun of the way they live, make fun of the way they think, make them do something so that they fail, so then we can make fun of them again. That's essentially how we entertain ourselves, and I know I do that too, right? I look at you, you do something silly, I laugh at you. That's entertaining for me. Yay! But it's derogatory, isn't it? Like even in our sense of, of entertainment, we see the same thing in sitcoms and dramas and even like our morning news shows. You get up and watch you know, the Today Show or Good Morning America, whatever it is you like to watch in the morning. What is it they're doing? They're putting others in their place and making sure they know where they are. And then adva we advance ourselves at the expense of other people. This is how we do business. This is how we entertain ourselves. That's our culture's way of living. And the kingdom calls us to something else. The reason we do that, I, I, I would understand that as to being the result of fear. The only reason I would ever put you in your place and then make myself superior over you is because I'm afraid of you, right? I'm afraid that you're going to do something to me. I'm afraid that you're going to take something from me. I'm afraid that you're going to threaten what is mine, my place, my money, whatever it is that is mine, that you're a threat to it and may take it. So I do it out of a, a sense of fear. I read this from this guy. Who wrote, he wrote it from Baylor. So you came from Baylor University. It's got to be smart, right? Because I'm from Baylor, by the way, if you didn't know that. There you go. He said this, in a culture marked by anxiety and fear. Well, let's just define that. Like, that's us. You and I live in a society marked by anxiety and fear. The very things we have traditionally called sin or vices become wise and prudent virtues. Think about that. Things that we have always considered to be a sin or a vice, like hoarding or greed or suspicion or taking advantage of somebody or, hey, that's just business. That's just that whole mentality has gone from what we would consider a vice and a sin. And now we elevate it as virtue, as prudent, as, oh, yeah, that's just the way you're supposed to do business. That's the way it goes. Because our kingdom has so separated from the culture around us that we don't even define things the same way anymore. And I think what this story does is it calls us back to remind us about what kingdom we belong to and therefore what ethic we follow. Christian hospitality, which is the answer, it's, it's us providing for the least of these, as Jesus says here, it flies in the face of that type of selfishness. It chooses love over fear. It's choosing to risk everything for the sake of living a kingdom life. It's knowing that I may risk something to care for you, even if you are unworthy as we would define it, and trusting that the Lord is going to take care of me. That the Lord's going to provide for me, that He's everything that I have, if I give it away, the Lord will come back and take care of it for me. Fear constricts us. Fear paralyzes us. Fear makes us look at someone else that's just like me and see him as a threat. Fear makes us think about self-preservation before anything else. But the kingdom of God overcomes fear, doesn't it? The very presence of God is the calming of fear. That's why literally every time God or an angel shows up in the scripture, what's the first word out of their mouth? Don't be afraid. Because that's what God does. He comes to us in our fear and he says, shh, child, take a breath. I'm in charge. 
it's going to be okay. The kingdom overcomes fear and it sets us free to use a New Testament salvation language. It sets us free to live and to love and to show hospitality even to the least of these and to do the mission that Christ has called us to do to find these least and call them into the kingdom of God and release them from their own fear to live a life of love and of mission as followers of Jesus. And here's one of these fascinating things. We just kind of, you just got to nerd out with me for a second and see how this is making all the connections. It's interesting that one of the great reasons that the church had such success in ministry in the first century you know, as the church came out of Jerusalem and just explodes all over the, the known world, you know why one of the reasons it was so successful was their overwhelming hospitality. Christians were so incredibly hospitable that the Gentiles and the pagans of Rome and of Greece were like, what is wrong with these people? They're so kind. They're so generous. They're so hospitable. They're so giving of everything they have for other people. They're like, what's wrong with them? And they would ask. And they would talk about Jesus. And that would change it. Like, their hospitality to the strangers of what you and I would know is is us, the pagans, the Gentiles, is what opened the door to evangelistic success. I think it's neat that our kingdom ethic supports our kingdom mission. That Jesus calls us, he says, look, I want you to live a life of sacrifice and of love for the least of these. And lo and behold, that's exactly how it opens the door to fulfill the mission that he has sent us on to bring love and salvation to the least of these. It's almost like he planned it that way. Like by design. I want you to think about Christian hospitality as the care for others and recognizing them as value. That that's an expression of the kingdom life. One of the fascinating things about this little parable is I want you to notice that the sheep didn't know what they had done. Like you look in verse, say, 37. You know, the king says, hey, you've done all these things. Come here and, and enjoy your inheritance. In verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we do this? You know, when did we see you hungry and feed you? And they go through all the things. When did we do this? And the king replies in verse 40, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. That these who he says are righteous, who he recognizes, who live a life of hospitality and of kingdom ethic that are the standard that we see as our lesson here, they were unaware that what they had done was right. They were unaware that what they had done was was the thing that Jesus was calling them to do. It's, It's almost like they were just doing it because that's what seemed right as the followers of Jesus. They didn't know that it was like check one, check two, check three. And I think this tells us something about kingdom ethic. And living a life of hospitality is not always something that's like preconceived. It's not always something that's like a conscious decision. Like I wake up, all right, I'm going to be hospitable today. Let's throw a party. Although it can be that. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's, I'm not being hospitable. I am hospitable. I'm a hospitable person. I don't practice the art of hospitality. That it's an outpouring of our Christ-formed character is what we see from these who were determined as righteous. Because think about Christ. Christ is hospitable. He provided for basic human needs. He cared for others. He saw them as valuable and sacrificed himself for their behalf. And so do we. This entire kingdom ethic, it's not a legalistic punch list of what Christians should do. It's not like you can go back through even the last five weeks. Like, well, if I do one, two, three, four, and five, everything's good. That's not it. The point is that I'm a citizen of this kingdom, and that changes the way I think. That changes the way I live. It changes the way I breathe. It changes my morality. It changes my my goals. And everything about my life and my way of seeing the world around me is now defined by the fact that I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. The, The ethic of that is then a tangible expression of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. It's not that I'm deciding to be a kingdom. It's that I am. That's who I am at my core. Because that's Christ coming out of us. That's Christ present in me and shining out into you. To me, that's life in the kingdom of God. That's what it means to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Is that Christ is so present in me, it just happens. And I don't have to think, oh, I've got to go do one, two, and three. No, I'm just going to pursue Jesus. And he's going to shine out of me. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us to, well, 
to be like Christ. I wanted to say to be more hospitable, but that's not even the point, is it? The point is to be like Christ. And that we would evaluate ourselves and see our, our life in reflection of who Jesus is. And in every moment, say, I want to be like Jesus. And if Jesus is hospitable, then that's what we pursue. If Jesus is sacrificial, then we are, are sacrificial. Would you help us to see ourselves in light of what it means to be a follower of Christ? And that that definition of who we are would then guide and define every decision we make, every relationship that we have, that we would be Christ-like to everyone. Would you let this ethic develop into us? And then through that, Father, would you grow your kingdom here? Let your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Let it come to Meridian just as you want it to be. Then use Grace Fellowship to make it happen. Would you bless us as we leave? Would you put people in our path to be loving and hospitable too? And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.